so welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to introduce myself again because I forgot last time. John very kindly offered to introduce me and I said, no, it's all right, I'll do it. And then gallop straight into um, to talking without doing that. Um, so uh, my name is Grace Moore. Some of you will have come to the other talks, in which case, welcome back. Um, if you're coming for the first time today, this is our last discussion of Trollope's Harry Heathcote of Gangoyle. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm hoping that perhaps a little bit later, I may be able to introduce you to the next speaker in the series as well. Um, she may be here later. So um, at the end of the last session, we identified a few things that we'd like to talk about this time. So I'm just gonna pop them up to refresh everyone's memory. Um, here they are in no obvious order. Um, and so among our discussions today, we'll think about race and national identity. Uh, we'll obviously talk about bias some more. That's a dominant theme of this work. Um, Wayne, you asked about Trollope's mother and the anxiety of influence. And in fact, that knits together really nicely with a question Renee asked about precarity. And so I'm gonna to try to weave those two things together when we talk about them. Um, we'll spend some more time thinking about gender because that's such an important thing to the, the novel. Um, we'll think about time. Um, somebody wanted to talk about nature versus culture um, and boundaries legal rights versus moral, light, moral rights, um, that issue of precarity. And then um, whenever I say I'm gonna end by talking about ending, somebody asks me a smart question about the end of the work at the very beginning and, and I, that never happens. So I've ambitiously put it at the end, um, but this is not a prescribed order in which we'll discuss things um, and nor is it a prescribed set of topics. And so other things will inevitably come up and I'm very, very happy to kind of meander all over the place to discuss the things that you want to talk about in relation to the, the novella. So I'll just come out of this share for the moment. Um, I don't have a structured presentation today, um, but I do have some slides that I'll kind of move into and out of when it's useful to have either an image or a quotation in front of us. Um, the, in terms of um, the, the protocols of today, I'm very happy for, to people, for people to just jump in, um, but if you'd like to raise your hand, um, it will help me please if you can use the, um, the raised hand signal, um, because then you jump to the top of my screen and I can see you. Um, but Ava and Courtney are very kindly monitoring the chat box for me as well, um, and they will try to alert me if I've missed your hand somewhere. So hopefully between the three of us, um, we should be able to um, to bring things together. Um, I really want to thank the Friends of the Dickens Project um, for sponsoring these this series of events, um, which have been wonderful for me and I've enjoyed them very much. Um, I also want to thank um, John and Courtney um, and Renee, um, who in different ways have been incredibly supportive of my involvement. Um, and of course, I want to thank all of you for being here. So um, I think then in that case, we might begin by thinking a little bit about um, Wayne's question about Trollope and his mother. Um, and Ellen, I think you probably know more about this than I do. So please jump in if I make a mistake um, or if I misrepresent anything. Um, I don't want to give you a full overview of Trollope's mother's biography, although she is an absolutely amazing and, and fascinating woman. Um, but I think, um, for the purposes of this discussion, we, we flagged the, the anxiety of influence as um, a, a, a topic to, to consider. And um, I guess the, the obvious point is that, you know, Fanny Trollope is a prolific um, travel writer and novelist. What's interesting about her, I, there are so many things that are interesting about her, but what's interesting about her in terms of her relationship with her son, with, with Anthony, is um, the way in which she um, she kind of turns to writing um, at quite a late stage in her life. Um, she's almost 50 when she first begins to write. And she writes as a way of, of getting her family out of debt. Um, her husband, um, Thomas Trollope Sr., um, was really kind of hopeless financially. He trained as a lawyer. Um, but he wasn't particularly charming. He wasn't very good at sort of interacting and negotiating with his clients. And so gradually his client base fell away. Um, and he then decided that he would try to top up his, his revenue by turning to farming. 
Um, and so you can see there's a big shift between being a lawyer and being a farmer. Um, and he doesn't seem to have been any better at, at, being, a, at being a farmer than he was as a lawyer. Um, and so the family fortunes were sort of slowly, slowly descending. Um, at the same time, um, Fanny and Thomas had expected to inherit a fortune from um, an elderly uncle. Um, in characteristic Trilopian fashion, um, the elderly uncle um, then remarried very late in life and his young wife produced an heir. And so suddenly the Trollops um, were not going to receive the, the great expectations they were anticipating. Um, and so with bankruptcy looming, um, Mrs. Trollop decided partly because she was incredibly impressed by the abolitionist um, and social reformer uh, Fanny Wright, uh, she decided to go to America. And um, while she was there, she was there for two years in total. Um, and she took her youngest children with her. Later, her eldest son, Tom, joined her. Um, and the idea was that she would try to create some kind of opportunity for her son, Henry. Um, Henry, as it turned out, had tuberculosis um, and died a few years later in Europe. Um, but um, in, in trying to create this opportunity, she, um, she built um, an emporium in Cincinnati, uh, which was known as Trollope's Folly because it was just such an impractical thing. Um, and her idea was that she was going to sell um, coveted items, items from the old country to, to people who had settled in the US. Um, unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, that went spectacularly wrong. Um, partly because her health failed, um, partly because her completely hopeless husband, instead of sending her the sort of luxury items that she'd hoped to be able to sell, um, packaged up 2,000 pounds worth of, of really not terribly marketable items um, and sent those in the hope of turning a quick profit. Um, and of course, these were completely unsaleable to the, the kind of, of purchasers that Mrs. Trollope had had in mind. And so the, the venture failed. And she became a bit of a, a laughing stock in Cincinnati. Um, but she decided um, you know, she was the sort of person who, when faced with adversity, would just kind of pull herself up by the bootstraps and get on with things. And so she decided that she would, um, instead of going home uh, hanging her head in shame, she would. Um, extend her tour across the United States, um, taking some of the eastern states, go to Niagara Falls, and write about her experiences. And so that resulted in domestic manners of the Americans, uh, which was a runaway success. And I think one of, the, one of the reasons it was so successful is that it kind of told English readers the sorts of things that they wanted to read about America and the Americans. Um, and biographers have also suggested that the timing of publication in 1832 was really significant as well, um, that because it, it coincided with anxieties about social reform um, and the extension of the vote in England, uh, that it really sort of spoke to the readership in that way. And so, you know, she made a fortune from this book um, and from that point onwards decided that um, this was going to be the way she would support her family and uh, set out on a really punishing regime that involved often writing two novels a year, um, sometimes juggling different demands from publishers like Dickens later would. Um, and she seems to have been incredibly successful. Um, and so she's just a, a really fascinating and incredibly resilient figure. Um, the thing that sort of comes out in a couple of the biographies that I've read is the awkwardness of her relationship with Anthony. She seems to have had a very close and, and warm relationship with her son, Thomas, her eldest son. Um, but in terms of Anthony, it seems to have been a little bit strained. Um, and that's partly, he talks about himself in his autobiography as being quite an awkward child. It's partly because of the precarity that Renee highlighted, the, preca that, the precarity of, of his upbringing um, and the, um, the fact that um, while Mrs. Trollope decamped to America, she left Anthony behind. Um, so he was left behind. Um, he was in school at Winchester. The, the bills were not being paid, so he was kind of embarrassed. Um, he didn't have any spending money of his own. Um, and, and I don't think he ever really forgave his mother for that. And what is interesting about the timing 
is that just like Dickens with the, the Blacking Factory experience, um, Anthony Trollope were, was around 13 when this happened. And so I think, you know, that is a time when um, a sense of abandonment can be really, really traumatic. Um, and so he shares a similar kind of trauma with Dickens, which might perhaps account for the drivenness of his behavior in later life. So I have a couple of quotations from um, Fanny Trollope's biography, which I'll, I'll just pop up on a screen share. Sorry, these are from Anthony Trollope's bi autobiography. So Trollope is talking, this is um, towards the end of, um, towards the beginning of his, his writing career. Um, and when he moved to Ireland, he got interested in writing. And I think partly because he saw that his mother had, had been able to make a fortune, he was getting interested in getting married to um, Rose Heseltine. And so he was thinking about how he could provide for her beyond the income that he was earning from um, his work with the post office. And so he took to novel writing. And he says, when I had been married a year, my first novel was finished. In July, 1845, I took it with me to the North of England and entrusted the manuscript to my mother to do with it the best she could among the publishers in London. So even though he's got this vexed relationship with his mother, he kind of knows that he can turn to her at this time um, and sort of capitalize on her literary contacts. No one had read it, but my wife, nor, as far as I'm aware, has any other friend of mine ever read a word of my writing before it was printed. She, I think, has so read almost everything to my very great advantage in matters of taste. I am sure I have never asked a friend to read a line, nor have I ever read a word of my own writing aloud, even to her. With one exception, which will be mentioned as I come to it, I have never consulted a friend as to plot or spoken to anyone of the work I have been doing. My first manuscript I gave to my mother, agreeing with her that it would be as well that she should not look at it before she gave it to a publisher. I knew that she did not give me credit for the sort of cleverness necessary for such work. I could see in the faces and hear in the voices of those of my friends who were around me at the house in Cumberland, my mother, my sister, my brother-in-law, and I think my brother, that they had not expected me to come out as one of the family authors. There were three or four in the field before me, and it seemed to be almost absurd that another should wish to add himself to the number. My father had written much, those long ecclesiastical descriptions quite unsuccessfully. My mother had become one of the most popular authors of the day. My brother had commenced and had been fairly well paid for his work. My sister, Mrs. Tilly, had also written a novel which was at the time in manuscript, which was published afterwards without her name and was called Chollerton. I could perceive that this attempt of mine was felt to be an unfortunate aggravation of the disease. And I'm sorry, my slides stuck. Um, and then Trollope talks about his mother at the end of her life. Um, and Trollope's, the tone of Trollope's autobiography is quite brisk anyway. Um, it's not really a warm and fuzzy document. And so we should keep that in mind as I read this. Uh, but he says of her, she continued writing up to 1856 when she was 76 years old and had at that time produced 114 volumes of which the first was not written till she was 50. Her career offers great encouragement to those who have not begun early in life but are still ambitious to do something before they depart hence. She was an unselfish, affectionate, and most industrious woman with great capacity for enjoyment and high physical gifts. She was endowed too with much creative power, with considerable humor and a genuine feeling for romance, but she was neither clear-sighted nor accurate, and in her attempts to describe morals, manners, and even facts, was unable to avoid the pitfalls of exaggeration. So this is kind of interesting. Um, he sort of begins by praising his mother and then draws attention to some kind of shortcomings in her writing. 
Um, and this is something he picked up when he began to write his own travelogue about his American writing. And he very much felt that it was incumbent upon him to, to set the record straight, to smooth over the, the feathers that his mother had ruffled with her very frank accounts of her experiences of America and her dislike of what she perceived as American rudeness. And so we can see her sort of pit him pitting himself against her in that way. Um, Thinking about parallels between Anthony Trollope and his mother, um, Johanna Johnson, who is one of Fanny Trollope's biographers, talks about what she calls the curious parallel between their experiences, that it's moving to America um, and observing the Americans that makes Fanny Trollope kind of attuned to um, the, the possibility that she can write something. And for her son, it's moving to Ireland. It's when he's in a new environment, just like her. And so she sees that as a kind of overlap between the two of them. Okay, let's take us out of the screen share for the time being. Um, and so um, I found all of that to be quite fascinating. And I think what in particular interested me about it was the way in which um, writing was very much uh, a kind of insulation against precarity. Um, that, you know, if all else is failing, then you can always write a novel to get yourself out of debt. Um, and I think if we can try to attribute Trollope's great energy to anything, then it's very definitely the example his mother set to him. And perhaps in some ways they're, they're more similar than Anthony Trollope was really willing to register. Um, there is kind of an interesting overlap between them. So I thought that that might lead us into a bit of a discussion of the precarious, um, both in the 19th century generally, and also in Harry Heathcote, um, because this is very much a novel that is interested in precarity um, and, and in the dangers of, of bush life and the precariousness of the, the settler existence. Um, so I'm interested to, to hear what you all think about the, the, the precarious, um, what precarity can mean in a 19th century context um, and, and, and how Victorians dealt with it or how the characters in the, the novella deal with it. So I've just opened, answered, asked a very wide question. Wayne, yeah, are you adjusting your camera or are you raising your hand? <laughs> Anyone like to say anything about Here I am. <laughs> Talking about precariousness, uh, didn't Anthony Trollope retain his job at the post office for much of his writing career? For a very it long seems time. seems to me, it's like Wallace Stevens, you know, in the insurance. <laughs> but that maybe that was a safeguard against the kinds of losses that his family had incurred. I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think, and and it's interesting that at, at one point his brother, his older brother, is working as a school teacher. Um, I think in Birmingham at one of the King Edward schools, and um, his mother gets wind of a rumor that Thomas is about to quit his job, and she writes him this utterly distraught letter, and says, you know, don't quit your job until you've got something else to go to. Um, <laughs> and I think that's very much a, a, an idea that that Anthony had internalized that you know having grown up in this financial disarray. And I think of all of the children to be the one to experience its effects most acutely um, by being at school and, and knowing that, you know, his family were not paying the bills, um, by seeing the house, the, the house being repossessed um, by its landlord and the contents being sold. All of that inevitably made a, a, a deep impact on him. Um, and I think that's the thing that, as you say, Wayne, absolutely is, is driving him to this regime of really, really hard work. Um, you know, this is a writer who gets up, like his mother, very, very early each, work, each day and sticks to a really, really rigid schedule of writing. Um, so there's real discipline there. And I think it's a discipline forged in that precarious experience. Susan. <clears throat> Thank you for the great introduction. Um, it undoubtedly and sadly wouldn't have been um, peculiar to Trollope, but perhaps also the experience of losing his brother to TB would have been another thing which just 
emphasized yet again the precariousness of human existence how long have you got and say sadly in at that time i suspect very few families didn't have that experience but it must have reinforced it and the day the difficulties of paying for medical care if you were lacking resources it was very immediate yes yes absolutely um and i think um you know it's it's not just henry who dies of tb um later his sister <laughs> um his sister emily dies um and um it's kind of hovering over the family and so he's absolutely familiar with um you know the idea of mortality Fanny Trollope herself gets really sick when she's in America. Um, she's otherwise a very robust woman, but she gets really sick in the US um, and she has to borrow money um, to be able to, um, to pay her medical expenses. Um, Anthony Trollope himself gets sick in London. And interestingly, when he's sick, um, he's also in debt. And so his debts continue to kind of accumulate while he's, he's being cared for. His mother does come to London, she leaves Paris, um, and she comes to London and she looks after him, but there's no way that he's going to tell her about the kind of financial straits he's, he's managed to get himself into. Um, and so, yes, absolutely. He's very, very conscious of, of how uncertain life can be. Um, and I think um, he, he really just kind of needs to make sure that he's got resources behind him so that whatever life throws at him, he's going to be able to cope. Ellen and then Michael. Well, I'm gonna qualify or differ a little bit We've just mm. been reading uh, Ralph Vier on this uh, list that I run, and I've read uh, Sutherland's long introduction to Ralph Vier. Just before Ralph Vier, he did a tremendous thing. He quit his job. He quit yeah. that job, and he had no pension, and he had the expectation he's going to make money on St. Paul's. St. Paul's fails. Yes. He's going to become an MP. He doesn't make it. He's going to write this great novel, and virtue starts to go broke. So three of the streams of income that he had expected didn't come. He, that was a tremendously brave decision. He also did it, as you know, because he got angry because they didn't promote him. So there we see him actually, I think, um, not holding on. And then I, I and then he does drive himself uh, to, because that's all he's got. He's got to write these novels. And he drives himself to, among others, uh, Ralph the Air. Um, I was gonna say precarity in the novel um, is different. Uh, it, this is a different novel from most of his novels. Yes. Uh, what mm -hmm. novel do we have? A novel where we have this action adventure, and fire is scary stuff. I, I I must admit that I have read a couple of times how you fight fire by fire, and I, I it's better when somebody on PBS describes it to me because then I do better. Uh, but uh, how can you? How everything could be burned to bits, and and so Harry can't sleep. And it's fiercely hot. And you never know. You have he's made a number of enemies, his own fault, some of it, his own fault. Uh, and so here he's made several people hate him. And all they need to do is set fire to his place. That's it. I yes. uh, never mind death. So uh the precarity of the novel is not so much uh what we're talking about, the economic precarity. It's even scarier. <laughs> it's it's going to be burned up, and a lot of the second half of the novel is driven by this. Uh, he's a, uh, Harry is a driven man over this fire, um, and it, it, because he, you know you can prove anything if you can get to make up the evidence. So child makes up the evidence, and of course Noakes turns out to be a bad man. He didn't have to be a you know. Uh, um, so Harry is vindicated there. But um, uh, uh, the precarity is 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 living in a colony where you don't know you don't know the weather, and he's trying to do these things, and and the climate is against him, the landscape is uh, is against him. Uh, I think that's a real theme in both Canadian. Maybe I said that last time in Australian literature, and I think I mentioned the the movie The Proposition. Mm. And also another one about uh, uh, this little, um, this one, of, uh, I can't remember it anymore. Uh, but at any rate, a woman named Lindsay, they go to this rock. Um, so it, it's the whole thing is against so the so it's it's uh, he's he's really very, very driven. And when and when he when he wins, in a way, it's a temporary win. It because he still has, um, he, okay, gonna be friends with this guy and so on. But uh, um, uh, I'm just so impressed by the the um, how scary it is, 
and even if the people weren't themselves uh, plotting against him, the idea of fire and, and what fire can do to you, of course, they don't know the climate. They come from England where it's wet and cold, you know, <laughs> and so that's a, so those are two comments. And in fact, Trollope did leap. He did leap. And then he was driven. And that, and, and two, that the, the, uh, the novel is about, um, uh, he doesn't, you know, he's a squatter. And he hasn't got, he hasn't, he may think he has the moral right to the land, but I don't know if he has the legal right to it. The other guy has the right to come in and select. So, you know, yeah. uh, right. And maybe they dismissed the Aborigines and all that, but they were there first. So, so this is a, a very hard, a hard thing he's facing. Absolutely. And I think there are different layers of, um, you know, conversations about the, the the right to land going on. You know, there's a sort of the unspoken one about um, the, the, the land that has been stolen. Um, and then there's the more overt discussion of the, um, the free settler versus the squatter. Um, and of course, Trollope's solution to this is to kind of bring those two groups together. Um, but yes, going back to what you were saying about Trollope, um, you're, you're absolutely right. He does put himself on the line at this point, um, particularly with um, taking on St. Paul's magazine, um, which was not a great success. <laughs> Um, and and you're, you're right that he does, you know, he knows precarity, but he also knows by this point that he's kind of got a brand. He's got a successful career as a novelist. And see, so he does sort of have enough confidence in himself to know that if, if one novel fails, he's just, he's just got to kind of barrel on and write the next one. Um, but yeah, I was really struck when you were talking, Ellen, um, there's a moment early on in the novella when Harry says something like, um, there isn't a pipe lighted on gang oil this time of year that might make a beggar of you and me. Um, and it's so true um, that just that possibility that a single match being lit could just kind of take everything away is, is really terrifying. Michael, I'm sorry, you've had your hand up for ages. Oh, oh um, well, I've, <clears throat> if you look at Trollope's career as a whole though, in his most successful novels, I mean, his focus is on continuity and the, the two institutions in English life that are the least precarious in the most long-lived parliament and the church. And, yes. and I think, you know, I think there's something to be said about his impetus for focusing on, on those two things um, it has something to do with his sense of precarity. Um, you know, continuity is, is the great theme of the, the Trilopian series novels. Um, and, you know, it, it, that seems to be the countervailing force in his own psychic energies. Um, the other thing is, you know, in, in the way we live now, um, the fury of speculation is depicted as a forest fire. You know, the, the, uh, you know, the, the, and, and the thing that burns down the most, you know, that burns down institutions is is a greed and speculation. Uh, you know, all of, all of Melmott's victims. But there's a, it's the, the metaphor of fire is what carries financial speculation and financial ruin throughout that novel. So there's that precarity, that version of that version of precarity in, in the, you know, in the in the non you know, the non-Australian novels as well. Thank you, that's a lovely point. Um, I haven't read The Way We Live Now since I started The Fire Project. And so um, that's a fabulous image. Um, and it's absolutely right, you know, a forest fire does take everything with it. Um, and so it completely makes sense as um, a, a metaphor or trope for thinking about um, financial, specul financial speculation and the way it can just ruin people overnight. So yes, absolutely. Um, and, you know, there is that, I think, in, in both texts, um, there is that sense in which, you know, they're, they're both underpinned by that Victorian fear of, of failure, that Victorian fear of being ruined, of, of losing it all overnight, um, whether that's through the idea of someone like Melmot gambling with, with people's money um, when they think it's being invested, um, and instead sort of just kind of using it for himself, um, or the idea of, of losing your territory um, with with some somebody some vengeful figure emerging from the bush and, and just setting fire to it. That's great. Um, other things to say about the precarious um, in Harry Heathcote. Um, when I started to think about um, precarity in this novella, I, I just started to see it everywhere. Um, it just seems to be such an important thing. Um, and so I'm, I'm keen to push this discussion a little bit further. Um, did people spot other instances of the precarious, um, things that you noticed as kind of tenuous um, or, or tentative about the about settler life in Australia? Um, anything at all? Oh, 
Well, one thing is that somebody can come along and buy the, the land by the water and you have no control um, over who, who buys, who has the money to pay. Oh, I forget what they're called. The squatters versus the- The free selectors. The free selectors, yeah. Yep, that's and then right. You, and then you have, um, I mean, for the women, oh, it just must be so hard because at least the men get to go around um, and see things. And granted, the women are um, um, maybe tougher than Victorian women, although he'd like, it seems like he's just trying to keep them as feminine as, as they would be there. I just remember it, it's uh, not quite on the same thing, but um, oh, the road to Corain, um, what was, oh God, the woman who became head of Smith College, her description of um, growing up and her family losing things, but more in the uh, 40s and 50s, Jill Conroy, Conway. Anyway, it's it's like it's still, I guess, in Australia, a very challenging thing to live out. We're, we're water. When are we going? Uh, like Ellen mentioned before, nature. We have no control. Water, fire, all the elements. Uh, wind. Will the wind blow this way and blow the fire up, or will the wind blow a different way so that every day in a way unless uh you, you almost have to be on tender hooks absolutely and i think that's something that really comes across in the narrative um that um this is not it's not a one-off so this is a christmas story so there are certain conventions that it has to observe um, and we can talk about those a little bit shortly if, if people want to um but um the problem with the book uh, or the interesting thing about the bushfire story is that it's never just about that isolated incident um and so like christmas uh, which comes reliably once a year so too does the fire season um and so you know harry might have thwarted this group of villains in their efforts to um to see him off the land this time um, we know at the end of the story that, you know, Noakes has disappeared into the bush and we'll never see him again. Um, but there's still that danger. There's the danger of the environment. There's the danger posed by the heat um, and the wind, as you say. Um, and there's a real sense in which that's that's just going to come back year after year after year. Um, so one of the things I've done when I've worked on this novel is um, I've used the Canadian affect theorist Brian Masumi. Um, and he wrote a, a really brilliant essay um, about fear of fire from the future. And he wasn't writing about 19th century novels when he did it, but it really lends itself to, to thinking about that, um, th that kind of genre. Um, and he, he sort of talks about anticipated disasters and the way in which once you've been traumatized by one incident, you anticipate disaster again and again and again. So for instance, two and a half years ago, I was running a Zoom class and my computer shut down. And so every time I join a Zoom class, I anticipate that this is going to happen to me again, even though it only happened that one time. And so the same thing can happen with fire, um, that you know, if you've experienced a fire, and particularly if you know that the land you're farming or living on is seasonally prone to fire, you anticipate that disaster again and again. And we talked a little bit last time about Harry's psychology and just how anxious he is as a character. Um, and, you know, it's, I think, you know, if we can imagine an afterlife for Harry, he's not suddenly going to relax. He's not suddenly going to be a different person who no longer anticipates fire. Um, he's still going to be very much afraid. And so in, in committing to living on the land, um, which he has, this is an, he's a character who is firmly of the belief that he's going to stray, stay in Australia, and that's where his home is now. But in making that commitment, he's also kind of committing to this life of anticipation, where he will just sort of wait for the next fire to come. Barbara. Yes, I have, I have two things. Um, first of all, those of us who had parents that lived through the Great Depression, I think are well aware of that, that uh, 
trauma, I guess, or the desire to habits of mind, that fear that it will recur again. You know, my mother always had money hidden in the house and uh, always paid her bills in person and all, all kinds of things that were um, because she was traumatized. But uh, this is an off the wall comment that I want to make that I've been thinking about since I read the last part of the book. Um, having had a Queensland healer, why are there no dogs? Yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> I mean, his, his life would have been much simpler with patrolling with a couple of dogs, right? Yeah, yeah, you're right. There's, there's no dog. Um, I, I don't have a good answer to that. Um, I think my, my off the cuff answer is that Charlotte probably didn't spend enough time around the farm to, um, to really have a sense of what was required in farming life. Um, but that's not an informed answer, but you're absolutely right. There should be dogs on the farm and the dog should be um, sort of looking to, you know, they should be the vigilant ones, not Harry. Um, Harry does like to do things slightly differently. And so um, I guess a another example is that he doesn't have shepherds. And so he's replaced his shepherds with, with boundary riders. And so maybe this is about Harry's unconventional approach to the bush, or maybe Trollope just forgot to put some dogs in. It's, it's, it's an interesting essay, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit like the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime in the Sherlock Holmes story. Maybe we can write a joint um, article about the absent dog in, in Harry Heathcote of Gangoyle. <laughs> Uh, I'm seeing lots and lots of activity in the chat box, um, and uh, I think it's mostly about Picnic at Hanging Rock, which is both a, a terrible, a terribly wonderful film and a, a fantastic and terrifying novel at the same time. Um, so yes, absolutely. Um, it's very much um, a companion piece to this. If you're looking for something to read next, I really recommend it. Um, it's, it's kind of spooky and chilling all at the same time. Um, Someone mentioned gender a few minutes ago in relation to precarity. Um, and I think it might've been Terry. And so I wonder if we can come back to that because I think, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the dangers of um, farming for Harry, um, but I think there's more to say about the, the women and um, the precarity of their existence. Um, so would anyone like to, um, to, to, to think about um, the way the women are represented and how they relate to the, the precariousness that the novel is, is outlining for us? Well, one of the interesting things is always with the British stuff in their colonies of trying to maintain a lifestyle in the house, the dinners, the dressing for dinner, as if there were in England, instead of <laughs> they're out in the the, the the bush. But it's, I've always, like in uh, Flame Trees of Thika, the whole thing of if they have a picnic, taking all the china and silverware with them, you know, wherever they go, it's boggles my mind. But anyway, I think Susan has a good comment, probably. Oh, well, just to say that, yes, you're right. Um, I think, you know, the, the idea of um, sort of transposing English lifestyle to the bush, I think, was particularly rough on the women. Um, and so Trollope tells us repeatedly that Harry's adapted his dress accordingly. He doesn't tell us anything like that about the women. So presumably they are just wearing these um, sweltering London fashions that would just be no good in the heat at all. Susan, yes. Thank you. Um, I think some of the habits on picnics were probably equally inappropriate in um, England as well, frankly. Um, I found it interesting that, and it's a little while since I read this, but there, there are, he looks at the position of three women at different stages in their life. Um, Harry's wife, the, mar the young-ish married woman with small children that she's obviously desperately concerned for. Um, his sister-in-law in the position of the unmarried woman, does she take the leap and marry? 
um, what does she do? Does she decide to marry and stay out in the bush or whatever? And Medlicott's mother, who's looking at it from a different generation, and they're they're all vulnerable. They're all teetering on the edge and just surviving and doing the best they can. But none of them, I should think, um, has a particularly relaxed life at any point. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> he crams a lot in with very few female characters. Yes, I think that's right. Um, and I think if we were, if we want to think about the extremes of the precarious, there are also the um, the women who are described as visiting the brown bees. Um, there are women who are dismissed as hags, um, and there are women whose purpose for visiting um, Trollope is just a little bit too delicate to lay out to his readers. But it's fairly obvious to us um, that um, you know they're they're there as sex workers, and so. Um, it, it shows us the full range of, of the difficulty um, that women face in the bush. John. Um, on female precarity, <laughs> one other uh, small thing to be said about Mary Heathcote is that she is the daughter of a failed settler. Yes, she is. Uh, That's so true. she has a history of financial uh, insecurity, precarity in uh, her her own family of origin, and uh, that that certainly plays into I think the the sense of her vulnerability. Um, um, and uh, there's one other female figure that no one has has mentioned in the uh, in the book, and that's Mrs. Growler. Yes. <laughs> I, I wonder uh, if you have anything, Grace, to say about Mrs. Growler, but in connection with precarity, uh, one, one could say that, I mean, she she seems to me reminiscent of Mrs. Gummidge in David Copperfield, uh, that is a comic character whose only function is to be unhappy. But her <laughs> unhappiness we could dismiss simply as a, an element of her character or her outlook on life, but it but I it it it, it does fit in, I think, uh, with the sense of precarity that, uh, um, um, uh, and, and at some some other at some other point in the discussion, I want to come back to fire because I think there's more to be said about fire. But I'll stop at this point. Um, thank you, John. If I don't bring us back to fire, please feel free to make sure I do because I would love to come back to fire. <laughs> as well. um, Mrs. Growler's in the wrong novel. Um, she she's a Dickens character, and I, I think that's why she's there. Um, I think this might be to do with it being a Christmas book. Um, I think Trollope is doing some slightly playful things with the Christmas story genre. Um, and I think that's why Mrs. Growler is there. Um, I also think, I've been thinking a lot about your question from last time, John, about Boscobel and his name. And of course, his name gets shortened to Boz in the second half of the, the book. Um, and again, I think that's a kind of playful dig at Dickens, um, you know, Trollope didn't really like the Christmas story, and in writing a Christmas story that's set in the sweltering heat, he's definitely, um, you know, doing something very subversive with that genre, um, and so I think that might be what's happening, but I, I like the idea that Mrs. Growler is just another precarious character, and this is a novella, you know, considering um, the, the shortness of the work, it is littered with characters with precarious lives, um, even the police officer who comes comes towards the end of the work to, um, to take depositions and then to go and see the brown bees. He's an Oxford man who's come out to the colonies and then failed. Um, so there are failed characters everywhere. There's Bates who stands as a warning to Harry. Um, it just shows, um, as Dickens did in Martin Chuzzlewit, how dangerous it is to, to, to up sticks um, and invest in a new life um, far, far away from home. Uh, Virginia. Uh, I was going to say about the precariousness of the women when they're left all alone during the day when they're going out to fight the fire and they're in the house by themselves. They have no idea if the men are coming back or not. And so they're so uncertain as to whether they're going to be all on their own suddenly and left alone. And that's really made clear, particularly when the cook leaves and then there's nobody there but the women and anybody could show up for them. The brown bees could come, anybody else could come. But every day that the men are moving further and further away and worrying about what's going on out take care of the sheep and the farm the women are left by themselves and that's a very precarious situation because they'd be in tough shape on their own if those men don't come back 
Absolutely. Um, I want to do another screen share. I'm sorry to give everyone whiplash by moving between screen, sh screen shares and the conversation. Um, but I wanted to share with you uh, a quotation from a, a story from later in the century. This is by Henry Lawson, um, who in lots of ways is, um, you know, an incredibly well-known um, Australian writer. And this story, The Drover's Wife, absolutely explores um, what you're describing, Virginia, the, um, the, the possibility of a woman at home having to face whatever comes out of the bush towards her. And sometimes it's a snake, and sometimes it's a person, um, and sometimes it's to do with the elements. Um, and so Here's a little extract. Um, you can Google the, the Drover's Wife and there are lots of um, electronic versions of it, which is why I haven't given you um, a page number here. The rain will make the grass grow and this reminds her how she fought a bushfire once while her husband was away. The grass was long and very dry and the fire threatened to burn her out. She put on an old pair of her husband's trousers and beat out the flames with a green bough till great drops of sooty perspiration stood on her forehead and ran in streaks down her blackened arms. The sight of his mother in trousers greatly amused Tommy, that's her little boy, who worked like a little hero by her side. But the terrified baby howled lustily for his mummy. The fire would have mastered her, but for the four excited bushmen who arrived in the nick of time. Um, and so I just, I, I wanted to slide that into the conversation to just sort of highlight um, that, you know, this, this figure, the, the image that was um, accompanying that quotation is by Russell Drysdale, and it is kind of an iconic bush painting. It's a 20th century response to that story. And um, it really highlights just how vulnerable women were dwelling in the bush. Um, and there are lots of other stories that, that capture that. Um, if anyone's come across the, um, the really quite spooky stories by Barbara Bainton, um, another 19th century Australian writer, um, she, uh, she is wonderful at showing us how vulnerable bush dwelling women are. And I think what makes the, um, the women at Gang Goyle so particularly vulnerable is the way in which they are so very English unlike the drover's wife who puts on trousers um, and, and sort of temporarily adopts not only the costume of a man, but also the behavior of a man because she has to, um, the women at Gangwell are still incredibly ladylike. Um, they're very refined, they're very delicate, um, they're very polite, and it's difficult to imagine them having to face those kinds of things. Um, you know, of course, one has to be resourceful and resilient and we would hope that they would be, um, but they don't look like characters who would respond well to that. Ellen. Yeah, I was trying, actually I was just, I was trying to remember that story. I couldn't remember it, the Lawson story. I read that once a long time ago. And there's another one that stayed with me because it's really terrifying when she's left alone, uh, but, but she is um, assimilating. His stories give you this really sense of the thing. The thing about this, uh, people have said how they want to hold on to their English identities, but you don't get them assimilating. For instance, when she marries Medlicott, they're thinking about how he has a slightly lower status than them. This kind of thing, um, and and the women. Uh, nonetheless, I think that uh, the his wife, Katie or Kathy, is it? Um, she she's. Uh, what happens if he dies? And she has to, and then this tremendous trip to go home. Uh, and and uh, I, I sometimes wonder how, if, of course they live so very far away and it's not just getting in an airplane, you've got to get into a, a, a boat and you've got to go for, and it would be a terrific effort to try to get back. So, um, uh, and, and, um, and I wonder when he writes about it, if it's really real, that's really the question how much when they were there, he presents them that way because Trollope will present women in the way he wants them to, to imitate. He won't present them as truly angry at times. He doesn't show all sorts of stuff about women and whether he's, he's being exemplifying, whereas the real women who would even live in such a home would assimilate far more, that quietly they would, they would wear something else. You see that in the John Caldergate, Mrs. Euphemia Smith. Yes, she's not a respectable woman, but she really uh, assimilates a lot. and, and uh, because Harry wouldn't want his wife to assimilate, but I just I, I just get the feeling that there's something unreal here. The other thing I want to say, because now you've brought up it's a Christmas story. 
Um, the lack of religiosity in the novel. I've seen, uh, this is my view, uh, anyhow, uh, in other novels. But when you read these Christmas stories, especially somebody being rescued and slave, saved, where is, the, I don't come across the word providence. We don't, it's not presented as providential. We don't have any, he, it's, uh, they did, and there, there was a chance and they won. But there's no sense that God was there doing it for them or behind them. And very often in Christmas tales, there's a very strong thump there is particularly in Dickens, of providence. I, Trollope also is not one for ghosts. You don't get anything mystical. I, and uh, and that, it's a very unusual Christmas story. Um, it, it doesn't have a number of the accoutrements that are so typical of Christmas stories. Um, uh, um, it's just a kind of... Right. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Um, and and I think that's that's partly to do with the strangeness of Christmas in the bush. Um, and the by this point, the the colonial Christmas story was beginning to emerge as a thing. Um, and and people kind of the, the public definitely enjoyed reading them and found them kind of interesting and strange. And so this is a story that is very much being written for the, the English domestic market. Um, it was being sold in Australia too, and people did read it in Australia, um, but um, there is kind of an appetite for the exoticism of, 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 this, of the, the Christmas story in this way. Um, I like the point about the, the absence of providence. I think that's really interesting. Um, and, and I wonder if it's just that because of his son Fred, Trollope is just kind of interested in in you know how the the individual can respond to all of these pressures of bush life. Um, so he's really this is a tribute to Fred in lots of ways. It's a tribute to Fred's hard work um, and a recognition of the many many challenges that he's facing in in choosing to make his home in the bush. Um, and so I, I wonder if that explains the lack of providence that this is a, a novella that is celebrating hard work um, and and people trying to be sort of resourceful in tackling the elements. Um, I have read, and I wish I could attribute this, um, I suspect it was P.D. Edwards, um, but I've read somewhere um, the suggestion that Trollope is also trying to talk to Fred through this novella and trying to advise him um, and trying to sort of show him that you've got to make some concessions to being in Australia. Um, and not just concessions of, dr of dress. You have to make some class concessions. You have to make some concessions as to manners. Um, and Trollope himself is quite adaptable in this way. We know this from his travelogues where he will just kind of, you know, he'll make decisions like, yes, I'm not going to wear my jacket in the West Indian heat because it's just too hot and it's silly to wear one. And so I think he's trying to model that through the character of Harry, who is perhaps an extreme version of Fred. I think that's quite a compelling way of thinking about it. Um, um, but of course, not everyone will agree. Uh, Susan and then Michael. Hi, um, just picking up on the Christmas story-ness or not of it. Uh, I obviously agree about lack of ghosts, mysticism and, and providence. But to me, it's a Christmas story because if it's about anything, um, it seems to be about love your neighbour and reconciliation. Absolutely, love your neighbor so long as he's not the brown bees, um, but you know, love, love your class appropriate neighbor. Um, but you're right, it is a story that ends with, with reconciliation. It ends with the, the resolution of the romance plot. Um, and so in that respect, it is very satisfying. Um, and it kind of ticks all the boxes of things that we would want out of a Christmas story. Um, Jude Peace has done some really brilliant work on, on this as on Harry Heathcote as a Christmas work. Um, and, and she's really interested in um, the Christmas story on the other side of the world. Um, but she's also really interested in the kinds of adverts for commodities that appear um, alongside the story in the graphic. And in particular, she draws attention to all of the potential Christmas gifts um, and notes that a lot of the adverts are for things like calendars, um, and clocks and I found that fascinating because this is a novel that is so interested in in time and the passage of time and charting time um, so I think that's a really interesting point I've got more to say about time as we move through but I want to hear what Michael and John have to say first 
Oh, just a quick thing. Um, um, Trollope was the most resolutely secular of all the great Victorian novels and his use of imagery. I mean, you think he writes, he writes eight novels about the Church of England. There is no religiosity in them whatsoever. They're about secularization and bureaucracy. So I, don't, I think it's completely consistent that this would be a Christmas story with no religious imagery and no religiosity of any kind. Um, it, it's Trollope. <laughs> yeah. Yep, absolutely. Um, and I think it, it also, it speaks to his discomfort with the Christmas story formula as well, that, you know, he's not going to kind of insert things into his story that he feels just have no place in the story. I think that's absolutely right. Good. John. This is perhaps a minor point, but it's uh, related to the lack of Christmassy elements in, um, in, in the novella and also to the biographical origin that this is a story about um, written by a father after a visit to a son. But one notable absence in the book in relation to Christmas is the absence of children. Uh, but we know that uh, Harry and his wife have children because there is a mention of uh, when the narrator speaks of Harry and his oldest son. And to say oldest son implies that there's more than one son, but there are no children mentioned as characters at any point in, in the story. And Christmas, of course, is something that is, is usually, uh, often anyway, uh, uh, associated with children and uh, games and, and sort of the, the, the return of, of childhood or childhood imagination. Um, so uh, along with the absence of dogs, there's the absence of those children that we know are there, <laughs> but that do not appear in the story. That's right. They should be ranging across the bush um, and, and tumbling up somehow or another. Um, I think the, the one instance I can think of, you're, you're quite right, John, of course. Um, but the one instance I can think of is towards the end. And I think the youngest child is a prop at the end that enables Mary and Kate um, to be around Medlicott <laughs> so that they can then sort of engineer the proposal that we know is coming. Um, but other than that, you know, the children really don't seem to be excited or anticipating Christmas in any way, shape or form. Um, they have nothing to say for themselves um, and um, are sort of embodying what people think they know about the Victorians when they talk about children being seen and not heard. Um, and it is, it's a very, very strange thing. Um, I guess it's probably because of the, the format of the novella that there's just not enough space to, uh, to kind of, to bring in the children as characters. But you're right, it's a very, very strange omission. We've sort of started to, um, to move towards thinking a little bit about, um, Susan says, thank goodness for a Christmas story avoiding cute children. God bless us, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we, we're starting to move um, to think a little bit about time, which I think will also bring us back to fire, which I promised John we would come back to. Um, so um, I wonder if there is more that we can say about time and the way it's represented in the novella. I'm really struck by the amount of waiting that goes on in Harry Heathcote. Um, we spend a lot of time waiting as readers, even though it's a short work, there's a lot of waiting for us as readers. And the characters are waiting for different things as well. So can we think a bit about waiting and, and how that might be important in some way to the plot? Barbara. Well, certainly the overarching thing is, you know, Harry's waiting for the fire. And we know from the beginning, the fire is going to come. The fire is going to come. But he's, you know, we know that he's, you know, slightly not more. He's paranoid about all these things and, and arrogantly refuses help. But still, it's... There's a long time that we wait and we're not learning anything about fire or bushfire per se. We're just waiting. 
Um, that's really interesting. You say that we're not learning anything about fire or bushfire. Can I press you to say a little bit more about that, please, Barbara? Well, just take that um, screen that you just showed us. The, the woman knew that she was supposed to take a green branch and, and try to put the fire out with, with wet, uh, a wet branch, right? Uh, but, and that is indeed what happens in this story, but we don't have uh, any prep for that kind of, uh, how do you, how is a bushfire different from a fire in Devon, for instance? How, what, what preparation is, is he making other than just roaming around at night and checking things? That's a lovely point. Um, and, and you're right, there's a lot of vigilance about fire, a lot of watching and waiting for fire, but you're right that there's not that preparation. And um, if we were to contrast Trollope's writing here with the work of someone like Louisa Atkinson. Louisa Atkinson was, was born in Australia. Her mother was a settler um, and she was a nature writer. So, and she grew up you know, she had a very unconventional upbringing and spent a lot of time roaming around the bush. So she had a really strong awareness of ecology, which she kind of fed into her novels. And when she writes about um, preparations for bushfire, she's absolutely always thinking about, you know, what do we need to assemble? What needs to happen to the land around the, um, the, the homestead to make sure that the fire can't come to the homestead? Which trees are we going to chop down? Um, what are we going to cultivate? Um, you know, what are we going to do in anticipation of the day that the fire will inevitably come? And so as somebody who has kind of had a bush upbringing, she's just more attuned to those things. Whereas I think Trollope, Trollope is very attracted to the idea of the bushfire. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, he never experienced one. And I think that comes across in the way that he writes about the fire itself. Um, and, and as you've highlighted, Barbara, in the way that he's not really thinking about the kind of practical things his characters need to do. Because you're right, it's not just about riding your horse around your boundary and making sure your fences aren't on fire. Um, there's lots more work to be done and lots more preparation to take place. Good. Susan. I found that the the waiting was incredibly effective for building the tension up because just as he's waiting we're waiting when's it going to come is it this chapter and on the point about harry's paranoia yes absolutely he is paranoid but i'm reminded of that line is it in goodfellas just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not watching <laughs> <laughs> And there is a lot of watching in this text, um, you know, lots of people watching each other, huge amounts of surveillance. So absolutely. Um, yes, so we, we are waiting for the fire to happen um, and we kind of want the fire to happen. Um, this is a sort of, it, it's almost a relief when it comes because mm. Harry has spent so long anticipating it and fearing it that in some ways it's, it's better once the fire is happening because he's got something to do. Um, he's no longer thinking about the fire, he's actively involved in fighting the fire. Um, and, you know, he does use, he uses back burning um, as his firefighting technique, which was a, and remains today, a, a tried and tested way of, of dealing with fire. Um, that, you know, if you're not going to be able to put out a fire using a hose, um, then one way to deal with it is by burning land to, strategically to try to prevent the fire from spreading. And so that's what Harry and, and his little team are doing. Um, but yes, you're absolutely right that, um, you know, we, we, want, we want to see the fire. Um, and because of the, um, the slightly trite closure of the Christmas novel, we don't have that sense, okay, and now we're waiting for the next one and the next one and the next one, even though that's going to be the reality for, for Harry. Other kinds of waiting in the novella, Ellen. Oh, just that uh, the, I was aware of the great distances. You seem to be, there seem to be everything's at a great distance. You have to wait for the police to come. You have to wait for this to, ha everybody's at a distance. And when they, when the fire is going on and the two women look out and they see this lurid red sky, um, there might've been a great, a great, uh, uh, I should think they would feel so isolated and afraid. 
again, I don't think Trollope gets that the way Lawson does. I, remember, I've, I, went, I'm, I got the old Lawson book. I have this old Lawson book. And he and um, he did at, he did himself spend time in Australia, but perhaps this came at the beginning of his time in Australia, and that later he was able to get a sense of this vast landscape. Um, he's better at it in North America because England everything's like this is silly, but England things are close. Rivers are this is ridiculous, but I'll say it. Rivers are small. Um, they don't, people don't go driving 900 miles to visit one another like Americans do. Americans will take tremendous different distances to go. And and uh, and he, I, I feel in the novel that that's another way in which it doesn't resemble some of the other Australian novels. Um, that that, uh, that, that they, they're holding on to their English identity unrealistically. Um, and there's a sense of it being a smaller world when it's not. Here and there, he says great distances, but he doesn't make us feel that there's this enormous difference, that there's this huge place out there that they don't, the two guys go off. That's a little scary. We're not, we have to, we have to really know that. How do you know they'll never come back? Yeah. You just don't know that. The Frankenstein at the end of Frankenstein, the creature just goes off. You don't know what's going to happen to him. So there's that too. Um, I, I think he is not a writer that does, is again, the mystical, he's so concrete. He's um, he's so physical that these things are 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 not what he's he uh, usually does. Uh, that's not to say that I'm just thinking. Can you forgive her? The, the depiction of Cumberland is had the distances, but it's not the same. They're picturesque. Yes, yes, that's right. Um, no, I mean you're right. There is. He, he talks about some things being far away, like the you know the doctor is thirty miles away, um, and he's going to ride it even though he's exhausted. Um, and so, yes, but you're right, there's not that sense of the long distance. He knows it. Um, in the travelogue, he spends a lot of time um, sort of talking about the distance. Um, and, you know, there are times when he's on horseback and he's riding um, through forests and he finds that really boring. Um, <laughs> he's, Trollope, I think, um, you yeah, know, he doesn't like repetitive, repetitive landscapes. Um, and so, you know, he's, I think at one point he's riding to to or through Queensland and he's talking about the forests um, and you know this should be a moment of wonder but it's not he's just bored because it's he's not such a man a easily unnerved he's yeah. not a man easily unnerved and he's not a man yeah he won't he won't he won't he won't mystify things this is so very typical of uh um and yet by the way just saying the other except for the one about the civil war the other Christmas stories don't have anything providential about them either. Maybe yeah. in the Civil War, there is the sense that um, God is, or some force is taking vengeance for these for this terror. The last couple of lines, the terrible enslavement that has happened. Perhaps this is a, um, a retribution uh, that they shouldn't have done this. And I think that's the closest I've seen him. Uh, and he does say that, it's, it's, and it's very unlike Trollope to have a, a god who's who's going to uh, take vengeance. But there are a couple of lines there where he talks about this tremendous bloodbath, um, and they're there. There's a sense of God, perhaps he's very careful um, taking vengeance on them for having done this, mm. having enslaved well, people. That's interesting. I'd forgotten about that, but you're right. Um, and, and it is kind of uncharacteristic. I'm just trying to think back to Catherine Carmichael, which is, of course, another Christmas story. Um, and I'm not sure that he directly invokes providence, but there are definitely providential happenings in, in, and providential deaths in Catherine Carmichael. Um, so, um, yeah, right. you know, I, I guess, again, it's about it's, it's partly about that sort of discomfort with with writing a Christmas story. Virginia. Yes, I was just saying in the waiting, um, I was certainly waiting for Mendicott to come to the idea that Noakes was bad. And so he felt like, you know, just kept waiting. When is he going to realize that <laughs> Noakes is a bad character? And it just took forever to get there that he was going to admit that, you know what, you were right. Noakes is a bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yes, absolutely. It does take him a really long time to arrive at that opinion. Um, whereas I think for us as readers, we can see it immediately. <laughs> um, right. Uh, we talked about some of the physical tells last time, um, but also, you know, he's just a bad character. And, and there are so many villains in, in the world of this novella. 
um, that's the other thing. We have this whole sort of cluster of villains. Um, and so we're kind of, we, we know that something bad is going to happen. We know that at least one of them is going to be behind it. Um, so we're waiting for the act of villainy. Anything else we're waiting for? Or that the characters are waiting for? Well, the sister-in-law wants him to propose, or she yeah, wants. Yeah, we're waiting for the proposal. She she wants some situation to develop where she can actually be, and and we're, and we're again we're we're uh, we're um we're obeying punctilio and decorum. So she's not going to say it herself, um, and she's not going to she's not going to create the situation. Uh, uh, um, but yes, yeah, she's waiting for him so so that she will be sure of having a husband. And that's part of the happy ending because the two families now will come together more. You'll that's to, right it's part of the happy ending yes absolutely so you know we're anticipating this proposal i think from the moment medlicott appears um because he's the only eligible man for miles and miles around so clearly something has got to happen and and trollope hints at that through his narrator um and so you know the characters are waiting for the proposal we're waiting for the proposal and i think trollope is is really compassionate in the way that he treats kate in that wait um, and the way that he highlights the kind of constraints under which she's operating, the things that she can't say, the things that she can't do, because, you know, she is still a genteel woman. She wants to, she doesn't want to compromise herself or her reputation. Um, and so she has to behave like a lady. But that means that she's just got to wait. She has no alternative. John. I'm not sure that this is something we're waiting for in the same way that we're waiting for the proposal, which um, you know, is a conventional way of of reaching closure, but um, are we waiting for law and order to assert itself and to impose some kind of control over the brown bees? I mean, the brown we haven't talked much about the brown bees, and uh, they're outlaws. I mean, they're sort of you know, they're they're settlers, but they're the old man is a lag, the uh, sons are in and out of prison. Um, they have something to do with the fire, we're, we're sure. Uh, they're the bad guys. They're also of a different social class, one that can't be accommodated by uh, a marriage plot. Um, so somehow the, the brown bees have got to be controlled or, or at least uh, brought into an orderly, a position within an orderly, uh, fiction and orderly narrative. So um, brown bees. Yeah, that's so interesting because they're, they're not really contained in the way that we would expect them to be. Um, you know, the, the police <laughs> go and talk to them, um, but nothing much really happens. Um, and, and it is kind of pointing to a, a, a different form of, of law and order and the way that that works in the bush um, and the way that perhaps it has to be different um, because the brown bees aren't going to go away. Um, they've got their, their, their land um, and they're settled there. Um, and it's kind of hard to see how they're really doing much other than poaching sheep. Um, Whenever we see the brown bees at home, they're, they're drinking um, or they're cooking or they're sleeping. Um, there's a lot of sleep going on in this text. I think there's, um, there's, there are things to say about sleep too. Um, and they have a sort of, you know, that Harry will, will sleep the sleep of the virtuous. He's exhausted from his hard work. Whereas mostly the, the brown bees seem to be sleeping off um, their, their latest overindulgence uh, and then they wake up and do it all over again. And so they are a kind of problem that is not resolved. Um, and so just like the fire, which is going to come back, we can't be confident that the brown bees are going to be kept into line. I think they are going to be a persistent threat. And, and possibly the only thing that is going to disperse that threat is that idea of class unity between Harry and, and Medlicott um, as a way of becoming a more formidable force against them. But it's not very satisfying. Um, and, and I agree that it's something that, that Trollope doesn't quite know how to resolve. And I think that's a broader problem of, of bush life and bush justice, um, that you know, there are these characters in the bush um, with these dubious histories, some of whom are able to be rehabilitated, but some of whom are not. Um, and you know, they, they're a, a fact of, of bush life, um, and perhaps you know, the, the settler has to learn how to deal with them. 
That, that's yeah. actually, Sorry, if I could, could add something else to this that I I'm, wasn't sure about. Ha Harry is a magistrate, but what are mm -hmm. the powers of a magistrate? Why does he, you know, he has to appeal to the police at the end, but as magistrate, he's responsible for having uh, sent one of the Brown B sons to jail. So that's right. I, I, d I, I, what, what's a magistrate and what are the limits of a magistrate's power? So um, my perception of how being a magistrate worked in a colonial setting, which is largely based on, on things I learned about Fred Trollope, is that it's kind of um, as and when it's needed, that you know, if a crime happens and the magistrate gets called in um, and um, will then sort of pre preside over a court hearing, but it's not like a job that Harry would go to from nine to five every day. Um, so because he's a gentleman, he's kind of qualified to dispense law and order. Um, and of course, because he's a gentleman, um, the police be he be believe him over the Brownbies when the Brownbies say, well, actually, you know, he did set fire to our land uh, because that's what he did. Um, and so there are some sort of interesting class politics being mobilized um, in terms of Harry's position within the community and, and his position in relation to the law um, and the immediacy with which the, um, the police sergeant is willing to believe his version of events. Um, but I think, yeah, it also raises some questions about the rigor of colonial justice um, and the, um, the, the way in which colonial justice could be upheld. And it is quite different from what Ellen was highlighting earlier when she mentioned the sort of smallness of the English countryside and, you know, being a magistrate in, in England is very different, I think, from being a colonial magistrate, um, just because so much can go on that people just don't know about. The land is so vast that it's easy to be like the brown bees, kind of, you know, filching a sheep here and there um, and being allowed to get away with it because it's actually too much bother to try to prosecute them for it. So it's also about picking your fights too. Ellen. Um, I seem to be complaining about what's not there, what's not there, but to some extent they're in other stories. In Catherine Carmichael, I believe the husband beats her. And yes. I believe that sex is awful. One of the things that's not there in this household is violence. There's a story called, you'll remember the, the author, The Story of a New Zealand River. It's mm. a New Zealand novel, a classic novel, Jane something with a P. Is it a, no, not a P. Um, M. It's Jane, on the shelf, but I can't see around to it. <laughs> Jane something rather. It's, it's a, uh, to everybody, it's a classic early New Zealand novel. And what it is is, is that she, she goes to, it's in Northern New Zealand and they're, they're doing timber. And the upper class males are violent and they do get drunk and drink is a way of coping with it. And Trollope in this particular novel leaves these two people utterly gentlemanly. You know, when you're getting really excited and you had enough, you can swing at your wife. You could swing at somebody. But in this novel, in that particular household, he does not allow the violence that we see in other places. He does not allow the drink. And that's another way in which the, no to me, I think the novel's a bit flawed. <laughs> I really do. I think that these things, because he wants a Christmas story, because it's his son, uh, obviously he doesn't want his son to be shown as, as being a drunk or getting violent or getting drunk. But in fact, the stories of Australia and it's real life. You can't hold on. And I, and I find that that's another unreal aspect of the household that was shown where in Catherine Carmichael, we see violence and we see hard violence. Uh, there's a Maori she gets involved with. And in John Caldergate, we see them assimilating. And in the story of New Zealand Ripper, who I cannot remember, Jane something or other, uh, we really do see these uh, uh, characters we're supposed to like, we're supposed to admire, we're supposed to be involved with them, but they get violent and they get violent to women and they drink. And, and it's a very, very hard life in ways that we're not shown what pressuring Harry, pressuring Medlicott. And I find that to be another problem in the novel. It, it's another, it, it, that, that, that then again, that there's, that there's this artificial unreal reality of um, perhaps because it is his son, uh, I don't know. Uh, um, and, if, and if his son, his real son, I'm talking about Fred, if Fred did sometimes drink, or if he did pump, pump up, get violent, I wouldn't be surprised. Well, Why I think what's... You know, I mean, there's just to say that that, that it's it's again, it's not in it's it's not in this household. The brown bees are these really bad people, but a lot of people faced with a colonial situation will not behave well. 
Um, I'm sure that's true. I think what's what's interesting is that Trollope actually, we know that Harry does drink alcohol, but Trollope tells us very clearly that, you know, it's brandy and water. Um, and and he the narrator often tells us, you know, this is this is Harry's second drink of the evening. Um, and so he doesn't drink excessively the way the, the Brownbies do. And so maybe it's about moderation um, and, and Harry sort of knowing that, um, you know, he's not going to succumb to um, the alcoholism of the, the, the brand, the Brownbies. Um, and the way that that is sort of creating problems for them, because for them, it seems to be a vicious cycle, um, that the drink is, is kind of fueling their, their criminal sprees. Um, I think we don't see, we certainly don't see violence in Harry's household, but this is a novella that is underpinned by colonial violence um, and by the people who've been driven from the land on which Harry has created gangroil. So there's a kind of invisible layer of violence there. I guess the other violent act that really shocks me every time I reread is um, when Jacko torches the underbelly of, I think it's one of the Brownby horses, you know, he, he I, I can't remember if it's to thwart um, Noakes or Boscobel or if it's one of the Brownbees, but when he, um, Jane Mander, that's right, the story of a New Zealand river, thank you, um, and it is um, Jane Campion used some of the story in the piano, so thank you very much. Um, but yeah, that, that for me is a shockingly violent moment, um, and nobody else seemed, nobody within the, the text seems at all bothered by it. Um, Jacko is quite proud of it as um, a way of kind of resolving the conflict, but it's horrendous. You know, somebody has just singed the underbelly of a horse. Um, and that seems to me like an absolutely horrendous act of cruelty um, that is perhaps um, a displacement of um, other kinds of violence that we don't see going on in the text. So I absolutely take your point, Ellen, that there is a huge amount of, of violence in colonial novels and stories. Um, the author I mentioned earlier, Barbara Bainton, um, wrote a particularly graphic and horrendous short story called Squeaker's Mate, which is about a woman who um, becomes incredibly adept to living in the bush um, and becomes a mate rather than a wife to the man she's with um, until she's disabled. Um, a tree falls on her and then he behaves with the most unspeakable cruelty to her and she's left sort of physically unable to move in a shed um, watching him with his new partner um, and just being treated uh, appallingly without, often without food and, and without water. And so there definitely is this potential to be incredibly violent in a context where nobody is, is necessarily scrutinizing you the way they would be in parochial village English life. Um, but, you know, maybe Fred Trollope, let's hope that Fred Trollope was, was a good man and was kind to his family. Um, and, and this is why Trollope found that it was unnecessary to depict it. But yeah, it was a sad reality of um, the frustrations of bush life. And, and it must have been absolutely awful for the women who had to endure it for precisely the reasons you outlined earlier, Ellen. And that's just the sheer distance from anything um, and the isolation that, that women would have experienced. I wonder if we can go back to think a little bit about fire. I promised John we would come back to fire. Um, and um, just thinking about the way that, um, you know, we spend a lot of this work waiting for the fire. As readers, how do you feel when the fire finally arrives? Is it, is it a relief to you as it is to me as a reader? Um, or, or do you experience different emotions, different ways of responding to that fire? Yeah, go on, Barbara. Well, as I said before, um, we we see no preparation. My reaction when it started, and he started building the backfire, and you know, having techniques to divert the fire, uh, I I kept thinking, well, why didn't I know that he knew this? You know, why? Why didn't he have his uh, 
almanac out or whatever book you used at that time to look up this kind of thing. You know, we have no preparation for what he knows, you know. Right, but so of course, kind of a surprise that he's able to deal with it, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess we would hope that for somebody who is as anxious a character as Harry is, that, you know, his anxiety might translate into some form of preparedness. But as, yeah, as you said before, we don't see that. And so it's a little bit surprising when he knows that he has to fight the fire. John. Um, this isn't the most obvious way of, of thinking about fire in this book, but uh, I was reminded of the myth of Prometheus, who steals fire from the gods and brings fire to humankind. And uh, that act is, is sometimes understood as the bringing of a power uh, that is harnessed by humans uh, and put to use in technology so that uh, Fire is a technology. And uh, I had asked earlier about whether fire is part of nature or part of culture. And it seems to me that it hovers in an ambiguous way across that, that binary distinction. And so I was thinking again, these are small parts of, of this story, but of, of cooking um, and smoking as uh, as activities involving fire that are not dangerous, that where fire has been assimilated into the world of culture, and uh, and cooking, we could say, is technology. The the brown bees, strangely to me, eat a lot of raw meat. Right. Uh, so what's raw and what's cooked? I mean, the the brown bees seem to be you know, not quite fully part of the world of culture and civilization. They seem to be somehow more, more to excuse the word, savage uh, in, in, in that respect. Um, but another thing about fire, if, if fire is the, the constant threat and the source of Harry's paranoia as he defends his boundaries, and we talked about the fact before that, uh, that fire does not obey boundaries. Fire, fire is is uncontrollable in that way, unless you use fire to fight fire. And so, back burning is is really a the appropriation of that that wild threat uh, to use in opposition to the threat that it it poses. And um, the other natural element, which is perhaps more, more difficult than fire to put into the realm of culture, although there are windmills, is wind. Uh, it's the mm. combination of wind and fire and unpredictable wind. I mean, uh, 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 fire, fire seems in some ways controllable uh, so long as it's in the right place. But what wind does is to move fire into the wrong place to make it to make it something that can't be controlled, and so th those are just some thoughts about this strangeness of of fire, which is both a danger and and a boon to civilization, and in in sometimes very very simple uh, ways like food. Absolutely, and it can move from being one thing to the other. So as you were talking about cooking, I was thinking about Medlicott's men, who at the beginning, um, Harry tells Medlicott, um, your men started a fire last week with their billy. Um, so, you know, they'd set a little fire to make themselves a cup of tea <laughs> or to get hot water um, and had created a fire that way, which was in danger of causing something more um, that more destructive. And so this can happen. Um, the, the, the campfire can suddenly get out of control or it cannot be extinguished properly. Um, Louisa Atkinson, the, the novelist I mentioned earlier, wrote a really chilling short story um, about settlers in a forest 
um, who don't know the bush well enough and who light a campfire and don't extinguish it and then suddenly the the forest goes up in flames um, and in fact because it's a, a gritty and, and realist story a, a family lose their lives um, and so this is very much a thing um, that, that bush dwellers were concerned about and the way in which the fire that seems under control in the Northern Hemisphere um, can suddenly get out of control when you try to do similar things um, in the Australian climate. Um, the other interesting thing about fire is the role of fire in the Christmas story. Um, when we think about Christmas stories, we think about families sitting around their hearth at home. The hearth is such an iconic part of the, the reading or the performance of the Christmas story. Um, and one of the really chilling things that you can often see, um, even today in the Australian landscape, um, is these hearths and chimneys just standing alone in the middle of fields where a fire has swept through and all that is left is the one part of the house that has been built to withstand the fire. Um, and it's such a strange and, and haunting thing to see them. Um, they're really extraordinary presences on the landscape. There's something quite ghostly and, and ghastly about them. And so, you know, the fire, the fire of the hearth is kind of comforting um, and something that we associate with the festive season, but not in the Southern Hemisphere. It's quite different. Um, and I think that, again, comes back to some of the things that, that um, Harry says about it not quite feeling like Christmas. Um, it's too hot. The food that he knows from the, the Northern Hemisphere doesn't quite transpose to the Southern Hemisphere setting. Nothing is quite working. And that danger of fire is so alien from his experience of Christmas where fire is a comfort. I think for me, the other thing about the fire is that compared to different accounts that I've read, um, Trollope's version of the bushfire is, is really quite tame. Um, and if you read accounts by Australian settlers, they're often, um, they often talk in terms of the apocalypse um, and there's really a, a strong sense of that destruction. And a trollope for me at least doesn't really capture that. Um, the fire is a little bit of a disappointment when it comes through. Um, I probably shouldn't say that, um, but there is a sense in which um, it's, it's all over and done with quite quickly. And one of the, th I mean, one of the things about representing a bushfire in a novel is that it, it is quite a fleeting thing and Trollope is incredibly successful at, at drawing it out. Um, until quite recently, there were not that many novels that, that or, or longer works that, that deal with fire in a sustained way. What tended to happen was that the fire was an incident or, or episode um, among many other things. And, and probably one of, the, one of the most preposterous examples of that is um, Henry Kingsley's work, The Recollections of Geoffrey Hamlin from the 1850s, which involves a bushfire and a volcano eruption. And I think there's an earthquake too. And it's just a sequence of, of natural disasters that um, in the context of the work, just look a little bit preposterous. Of course, in the context of our lives today, they look more and more possible um, as you know, climate change is, is changing the way that we experience disaster. Um, so I think Trollope's bushfire is quite tame. Um, and I think that's, that's inevitable because he's not a settler writing about fire. Um, he's someone who is visiting Australia, who's heard about fires, um, but hasn't experienced them. Um, and so, you know, he's got a different way of perceiving it. And that's something that I've seen too in, um, in fire art. Um, so when I was working in Australia for the, the Centre for the History of Emotions, one of the things we did was to work with um, a museum that collected um, art connected with, with mental health. And they, um, the DAC Centre in Melbourne, and they, um, they did a collection of art, uh, an exhibition of art by bushfire survivors. And they included in that exhibition art by children. And what was really astonishing and, and chilling about those paintings by very, very young children who had experienced bushfire at first hand um, was the way in which the fire just took up the entire page. Um, just picture after picture with not a space of, of white paper to see um, because that was their experience of the fire. It was just something all engulfing. And so I think um, it probably takes that experience of, of, being, of being a witness to a bushfire to be able to really understand just how all consuming it is. Um, I think at one point, um, 
carry, um, no, it's actually one of the, the women, one of the women says the heavens were on fire. Um, and, and that kind of, I think that's the closest that um, Trollope comes to capturing that all consumingness of the fire. Ellen. I don't know if they have to just ask an uh, asking question. I know there are statistics of people emigrating to Australia. I've seen uh, Peterson, I think she has a book. She's one of these people who writes. But I'm wondering if they know statistically how many people left. That is when you came there and you were gonna you were gonna be you're gonna colonize and you're gonna have this good life, but then you're there for about <laughs> a few months and you say, well, wait, it made a minute. Uh, I wonder how many because it must have there must have been people who said, uh, I've had enough of this and I want to go back. And I, I wonder what the do they have any idea of the percentage of how many people really stuck it out? I wish I could answer that question, but I can right, tell right. you that you can get an answer. So the Australian government um, has a whole raft of statistics about exactly that sort of thing. Um, and you can look at that. Um, I'll, I'll send you a, a private email later. But it's definitely available online. I mean, I guess the problem is um, the cost of going back. Um, that for you know for some people it's like like with Harry Harry has put everything he has into his sheep station and so he's got to make it work he has no money to take them back um, and so he's got to he's committed to staying and I think for a lot of people you know they had scraped together everything or they had borrowed from um, people like um, Caroline Chisholm's Family Loan Society, um, they borrowed the money to get to Australia and so they couldn't just say okay this is horrible we're going home now, they had to tough it out and so they, they developed coping mechanisms um, and some of those were aesthetic coping mechanisms where they would kind of try to see the land around them through very, um, very European eyes, adopting a very European aesthetic as a way of trying to maneuver themselves around the land um, and to try to make a home there but you know it must have been horrendous for those people who just thought no this really isn't for me it's too hot it's too nasty john picking up on on your uh use of the word tame to describe the fire uh, i i i i think that is i think it is true that the fire for purposes of fictional closure uh, has to be tamed. Uh, and so, although it is a frightening threat in Harry's imagination, Harry's paranoia, uh, finally, in terms of the fiction, it is not as apocalyptic as, as it might be in some imaginings of, of, uh, of, of wildfire. And uh, one other way in which, of course, it, it it is tame is that it serves the purpose of bringing the uh, the Medlicots to the Heathcote home uh, and therefore advancing the marriage plot. Um, and one could even say that, that fire, in addition to bringing about marriage and the reconciliation between Medlicott and, and, and Harry uh, and the class uh, solidarity that results from that, is also uh, fire is often uh, uh, a, a symbol for passion. So we have a tame love story where passion <laughs> in terms of a tame version of that, not romantic, you know, not uh, Heathcliff uh, and Kathy, uh, but, uh, you know, holding hands uh, is, is sort of the big sex scene in, in, the, in this uh, novella. Uh, and it's a tame version of, of passion. It's not uh, a violent, apocalyptic, self-destructive or potentially destructive form of, of passion. It's, uh, um, it's, it's Trollope after all. That's right. So the fire, it faces barriers to, um, to the marriage. Um, and so it's important in that way. Um, but yes, you're right, there is something kind of tame about the fire. But there's also something interesting, you were talking before, John, about sort of harnessing fire and the, the Promethean dimension. Um, and I'm going to try to stretch what you're saying here. And you know, that's what Trollope is doing. Um, he's kind of he's taming the fire and using it to maneuver his characters to maneuver his plot along to bring about the closure that we have to have, because this is a Christmas story and it can't end with um, gang oil burning to the ground and Harry losing everything, um, which is much more likely to have happened to him in a bush context. 
next. And so absolutely, um, Trollope is, is harnessing that fire, taming it, using it, um, and, and seeing its possibilities for narrative um, and seeing its possibilities to bring about the, the plot resolution that he wants. We haven't really said very much about arson. Um, I think we talked about it in the first session um, in quite general, in quite a general sense. Um, but I think, you know, we have a band of potential arsonists in this text. Uh, we have the brown bees, we have Noakes, we have Boscobel, uh, we have all of these disaffected people sort of roaming around the bush. Um, and I guess, you know, I wanted to talk about arson briefly because it was such a great concern within colonial Australia. Um, and it had such a great potential to, to inflict damage. You know, if, it's a, if, you're, if you live in a pastoral society, um, in a society where much of the wealth is generated by farming, then fire poses a particular threat. Um, and Australian settler prosperity, um, you know, it was founded in, in several things, but farming was an, a really, really important component. Um, and so I think one of the things that Trollope really captures is um, just how dangerous the arsonist was. And um, one of the things that I noticed, I, I was going to bring um, to this session a, a newspaper account of a pastoral arson trial or plot. Um, but the problem was that they were all really, really long. Um, so I'm going to urge you instead uh, to have a look at this site, which is trove.gov.au. And if you feed, I've just put it in the chat box. Um, if you feed in the details, um, uh, it, it gives you a little, it will allow you a date range. Um, and if you look for arson stories between um, 1870 and 1874, which is what I did because I was wondering if there was something that particularly captured Trollope's imagination when he was traveling. What you'll find is a series of really kind of engaging accounts of trials connected to arson and fire setting and incendiarism um, that read very much like Harry Hethcote of Ken Goyle. Um, they're very sensationalized in the way that they report. Um, they could almost be a work of fiction. So um, if you get interested in that kind of thing, it's really worth having a look because they're quite riveting. Um, but they, they also capture just how serious a crime arson was in colonial Australia um, and, and the danger that it could do. And I think that's, Trollope uses that to really emphasize the villainy of his villains, that you know, if they're willing to, to resort to arson, then they must be villainous indeed. Um, because as somebody said at the very beginning, arson is one of those things, thank you Courtney, um, one, of the, um, one of the things that, that Trollope is really highlighting um, is the, the way in which the arsonist can just undo so much hard work, so much um, effort on the part of the characters. Ellen. Just another somber note, I can't help but make the comparison. I mentioned the uh, the story set in America, um, very terrible because America is a big place and they were just really uh, founding it. Uh, white people setting fire to black people's houses after the Civil War, they would burn down whole areas, white people of black people, um, and they would get away with arson. And um, we don't have a lot of stories about that because people didn't write about it. They're coming out now more about it. So you also can find in this other new country, meaning the US, uh, the use of, of arson uh, to uh, get back at other people. And uh, arson was a terrible fear for black people um, in the second half of the 19th century and into the 20th, the night that Malcolm X was killed, the week before his mother, his house had been firebombed with his wife and children in it. This is what people don't talk about and what we're trying to talk about and they want us to stop us from talking about, but it actually was a real, uh, a real, a reality uh, of down South um, and in the West, uh, the use of and it's, it's It's such a vengeful crime. Um, oh, it's, it's, it's uh, appalling. There's a, a a young researcher in New South Wales called Gemma Clark, um, and she is particularly interested in, in arson as what she calls a crime of the disempowered. Um, it's something that people resort to when they feel completely um, voiceless. 
um, whether they are or not, um, and 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 totally disempowered. And I think that's why in colonial plots, you know, you often see indigenous characters setting fire to things, and it's because of of colonial anxiety about um, dispossessed people. Um, it's also because they misunderstand land management, um, but there is that sense in which um, those plots are, are capturing the way in which um, settler culture has completely disempowered the traditional custodians of the land. Um, I wonder, I, I don't want to drop this thread on Arsene, but I, I, I am conscious that we don't have much longer. And I did say that we would talk a little bit about race today as well. Um, and so I wonder if I can steer us in that direction, um, but not so clumsily that we, we drop this thread at the same time. So I, I want people to be able to come back to the Arsene concern if they would like to. Um, but I think, John, at the end of the last session, you mentioned that you would like to spend some more time on race. And I think you very helpfully conceptualized Harry Hethcote as, as an international novel. And you listed the, the, the cast of international characters in the text, um, which, you know, for such a short work, it's kind of, it's, it's interesting to see this, this array of people from Europe um, and, and Australia and um, the Pacific Islands um, and elsewhere. So um, I wonder if we can think a little bit more about the way Trollope depicts race in Harry Hethcote and what he's doing. Um, so Wayne, sorry, your hand went up. Am I unmuted? You are unmuted. Okay, great. Well, I'm so glad you brought that up and I want to thank you for that really wonderful uh, overview of uh, Francis Trollope, oh, with which you. you began, it's really great. But she was, anti-slavery as yeah. Dickens would be after her. And one way that she offended Americans was in her pretty severe treatment of slave owners and uh, the people she met in Cincinnati and elsewhere who owned slaves. Now, unfortunately, I haven't read all of her works, but when she co quotes some of the dialogue, there's no way you could teach it in a modern classroom. <laughs> it is very politically incorrect. But I always suspected there's a good deal of influence of Francis Trollope on American notes. Uh, I don't think it's coincidental, especially. In, I think there's one scene in an American literary club that I think Dickens pulled out and <laughs> redid. <laughs> Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and, and I think in lots of ways, you know, Trollope is, is using, sorry, Dickens is using Fanny Trollope's work as a guide as he's traveling through America. And there was this sense in which writers did that. Um, so Frances Trollope herself was following a, another travelogue that had been very successful. I'm completely blanking on the author's name right now. Um, but she had, she actually became friends with the author and he in fact helped her get the work published. Um, but um, yeah, there, there is this um, connection between those works um, and, and Fanny Trollope was appalled by what she saw um, of the treatment of slavery. Um, I think in, in some ways, you know, the, the way that she renders dialogue and, and dialect is, is absolutely problematic. Um, I don't want to try to sort of defend historical conventions in this way, because you're right, I, I would not read that in a classroom to my students. Um, and I think it would be deeply offensive were I to try. I think to defend Fanny Trollope, she's trying to capture um, an authentic voice for the enslaved people. She's trying to highlight um, you know, their identities and who they are and their culture. It doesn't quite come off to us as modern readers, um, just as you know, some of the things that Anthony Trollope says about race, um, you know, some of them are, are completely execrable. Trollope too was, was anti-slavery, um, but it doesn't stop him from saying some appalling things ab about um, non-white peoples you know, throughout his, his career as a writer. Um, and so I think, um, you know, he, he does lots of interesting and, and good work in, in writing about Australia and writing about the Australian context, but it's very, very uneven. Um, and there are lots of things in, in Anthony Trollope's writing that I equally would not be willing to read out in a group of people and that make me incredibly uncomfortable when I read them. Ellen, yeah. 
There's a difference between an anti-slavery person and an abolitionist. Uh, Harriet Martineau was, a, was an abolitionist. And if you read the writings of an abolitionist, then you, uh, then, then you see the great difference in somebody who simply is against slavery, which is a very different kind of thing. And they might be against slavery in the long run, not against slavery, let's get rid of it tomorrow. Dickens, of course, had newspapers and uh, the American Notes, the second half, the la that last chapter, what he how he, he indicts, he has a very easy time indicting Americans. Just read what they write in their newspapers and how they describe these enslaved people. So he he uh, he he um, he escapes some of the things that that Fanny Trollope does because he simply quotes the uh, the enslavers themselves. Yes, um, actually, John Bowen wrote a brilliant piece about twenty years ago um, using um, the, the the final pages of American Notes and and thinking through some of the stories, um, and um, it's just a brilliant, brilliant piece of work, um, and and really shows you know the way in which Dickens, among other things, the way in which Dickens um, was sort of pasting together those experiences, and it's partly because you know he he was not comfortable being in the the slave states, um, and so he spent very little time in states where slavery was practiced um, and um, you know he was much happier in the north. Um, can we say a little bit more? Sorry Wayne, you've, your hand has gone up again. Oh no, no. I uh, just have one question. Do you think there's any way that uh, Francis Trollope could be laundered and could enter the world of uh, feminist criticism? Because when I studied it in graduate school, uh, she was completely off the board, never even mentioned. But she did have a very, I think, fascinating career. But I, I hate to think that just her terminology might be keeping her out of the canon, put it that way. Um, I'm not sure that that's the case. Um, I, I think it's actually about accessibility. Um, and so there are, um, there are editions of her works, um, but they're published by an academic publisher I'm not going to name. Um, and they're extremely expensive. Um, and so I think it's it's often about, you know, just accessibility to the text and maybe with um, online resources that will shift. Um, I'm not sure that we need to clean up the past. I think we need to, um, we need to kind of confront it um, and maybe not launder her, but, but you know, confront the realities of, of you know, the problematics of, of talking mm -hmm. about race in a Victorian context. Um, and and you know thinking about um, how we discuss that sensitively in the classroom, um, and and just yeah accepting it as not accepting it. Um, I don't mean accepting it, but but confronting it as a part of a Victorian life. Um, you know there are lots of um, well-intentioned Victorians who find no incompatibility between you know saying some things that we find incredibly offensive and behaving in a way that they thought was very compassionate. And I think we have to understand that. And we have to understand it as part of a collective history um, because you know, all of that history has sort of compounded to bring us to where we are today. And so I think we, we can't launder it. We have, to, we have to look at it, we have to examine it. Um, my first writing was on, um, was on Dickens and, and Empire. And so you know, a lot of the things that I found there um, in that project um, were things that I did not know about Dickens and that I found incredibly challenging and, and tricky to deal with. Um, but I think it's really important that we don't sort of push them to one side, that we do look at them and talk about them um, and make sure that our students are talking about them too, because they give us a different way of understanding somebody who has such extraordinary influence over society. Um, and in her day, you know, Fanny Trollope was a very, very influential person. So again, I think we, we need to be able to understand everything that she has to say. And we need to understand why she said it um, and, and you know, the potential problems behind what she's saying. So I hope that's not a kind of, uh, I'm not trying to sidestep what you've suggested, um, but I do think it's a, it's a thorny problem and it's one that we have to confront head on. Um, could, we, could we think a little bit more about race in, in Harry Heathcote? Um, because I, I am really struck by, by John's observation, um, and I really would like to, to talk a little bit more about race and the characters. Um, maybe I can give this a little bit of structure. Um, we were talking last time about, um, sorry, I've gone into my slides without sharing a screen with you, and I have to get out of them, but I can't. 
Um, I talked a little bit last time about the um, Pacific Island sugar workers. Um, so I wanted to read a quotation from Trollope's travelogue um, in which he, he talks about his experience of, of seeing sugar workers. Um, so let me just share a screen. He says, I've seen these men working under various masters and at various employments. No doubt their importance to Queensland mainly attaches to the growth and manufacture of sugar, but they're also engaged on wharves about the towns in meat preserving establishments in some instances as shepherds and occasionally as domestic servants. I've told how I was rowed up the River Mary by a crew of these islanders. They're always clean and bright and pleasant to be seen. They work well, but they know their own position and importance. I never saw one ill used. I never heard of any such ill usage. The question to my mind is whether they are not fostered too closely, wrapped up too warmly in the lamb's wool of government protection. Their dietary, by which he means diet, is one which an English rural labourer may envy, as he might also, if he knew it, the general immunity from the crushing cares of toil, which these young savages enjoy. And to highlight the kind of disjunction between what Trollope's saying here and the reality of the lives of many of these Pacific Islanders, I've given you a, an image from an exhibition, Colonial Sugar, which took place in Wellington. Um, this is um, a, an installation of life-size skulls made from brown sugar by Jasmine Togo Brisby um, to try to commemorate um, the many people who were kidnapped and enslaved as part of the sugar industry. And at the end of the, the last session, um, John mentioned these Pacific Islanders um, who really don't have, they don't have an enormous role to play in the novel, but they're kind of, they're invisibly present. Um, I think the narrator or Harry mentions them once, but of course they're underpinning all of the work that Giles Medlicott's Sugar Mill is doing. Um, and so the fact that they're present in the narrative at all is, is really fascinating. And I think it speaks to that propensity that we, we talked about before of, of Trollope perhaps having realized that he didn't get things quite right in his travelogue um, in having learned more about the state of, of Pacific Islanders in the sugar industry and perhaps wanting to bring them back into view, not in the same way that he does um, with, with um, for instance, Indigenous Australians, where he actually spends a lot of time trying to atone in his fiction for some of the things that he said, um, but just by making them a little bit visible temporarily, I, I, I find that interesting. John. Um, our time is almost up, so uh, I, I have two things that I would like to do as the official sponsor of Grace's series of talks. One, of course, is to thank her. But before I do, I want to remind everyone here present that uh, there will be another series of Friends Fellowship uh, series talks, um, also with an ecological theme. And these will take place in April, May, and June of this year to complete this year's series of Friends Faculty Fellowship talks. And the speaker will be Deanna Kreisel, uh, who is a professor at the University of Mississippi. And she will be presenting three talks. The first will be on her own current research. She's uh, currently working on a book entitled, It's the End of the World and We Know It, Ecological Grief and the Work of Utopia which is about the topic of ecological mourning and utopian thinking from the Victorian period to the present. And so she will be giving an initial presentation that is an overview of that book and its research. And then the second and third sessions in the series will consist of an in-depth discussion of William Morris's utopian novel, news from nowhere. And so uh, there will be more information about Deanna's talks uh, and about Deanna herself and her research forthcoming from Courtney. So I, I hope that uh, many of you will be there for that uh, discussion and for uh, Deanna's uh, presentations. 
So the last thing, of course, is, is just to thank Grace for what I think has been a wonderful and enlightening series of discussions. Uh, what a wonderful teacher Grace is. I, I'm, I'm happy to have had her as my teacher uh, during these, these talks. And uh, I wanna thank her for, uh, for, for her presentations and also uh, just for taking the time out of her busy life to, to speak to us. So, so join me please in thanking Grace. Grace uh, and uh, we hope to see you at a Dickens universe uh, soon, Grace. Thanks. Thank you, John. And thank you so much for having me. Um, I really appreciate everyone's participation, um, which has been wonderful for me. So um, it's been a great privilege. Thank you all very, very much.